We're starting off with uh, Professor Maxim Roginsky from the University of Illinois Urbana Champlain. He needs no introduction, so I'm going to do it. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here seeing all these uh, faces that I haven't seen in the same room since 2019. Um, it's also good that finally everybody is working on learning theory. <laughs> <laughs> Because 15, year, 15 years ago, I was like the only information theorist who worked on learning theory. And now I'm more of a control theorist, but um, I still do information theory. And here I am. Anyway, so this is, uh, this is joint work with my uh, graduate student, Yifeng, Yifeng Chu, um, who was actually an undergrad at Illinois. And then he uh, decided to stay because that's how fabulous it is in the cornfields. Um, so he's really ramped up. In fact, uh, just, just recently, there are three papers of his uh, up on archive, including this one. So, uh, so let me uh, kind of get right into it. So, so uh, there will be connections to, to what you heard in, in, in Tara's uh, um, keynote, having to do with codes, having to do with, uh, with complexity, of, uh, um, complexity of various uh, spaces and uh, the interplay between these. So, um, I mean, it's about, so, so, so the topic here is Suprema of Random Processes which sounds very dry and probabilistic, and it is, but uh, I'll explain um, briefly why learning theorists should care about this or why information theorists should care about this. But the setting is like this. We have a stochastic process, xt. Here, t is symmetric space, which I assume to be compact. The process is centered, so it's zero mean. And we're interested in, in uh, upper bounding the expected supremum of, of xt. And we want upper and lower bounds in terms of some measures of complexity of t. Here, the idea is that um, as a function of t, the random variables may be correlated. And if they're correlated, or let's say values of uh, t and t prime that are nearby, you could say something about xt versus xt prime. And if there's a lot of structure in this, you can actually exploit this to say something about this, this bound. Like for example, uh, if, if, if t is a finite set, uh, and all the, uh, all the XTs are independent, then uh, a very simple argument shows that you, you should only expect something on the order of square root of log T to be the supremum. And this is, you know, a log of, uh, of, of, of a cardinality appears and, uh, you know, CS theorists will immediately say that this is information theoretic. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Every time there's like a log of something, yeah, it's information theory, it's entropy. But, um, <laughs> But uh, um, it, it turns out that uh, you can actually uh, relate it to, to entropy like qu quantities, even when um, T is not finite or when uh, XTs are not independent. And this just lists uh, a variety of applications. So for example, if you open this book by Michel Talagrand called Upper and Lower Bounds for Stochastic Processes, you'll see all these applications. In the context of learning theory, where you would expect to see something like this is when you're trying to analyze, let's say the behavior of something like empirical risk minimization, and uh, you use something called symmetrization, you end up with a quantity called the Rademacher average. Uh, here, of course, I stylized it and I removed all the complexity, all the structure that, that comes from learning. All it is here is just a, a standardized sum of uh, random variables. These epsilon i's are just random minus one plus one uh, bits. And ti's are coordinates of a vector t, and this vector will come from, let's say, losses um, of some hypothesis on your training data. And it turns out that controlling the size of this process is uh, closely related to things like generalization error of empirical risk minimization. And here, the metric, of course, is just the Euclidean norm on, on these uh, s and t's. And this is why I normalize it one over root n as opposed to one over n. Um, OK. so. Uh, the main result uh, that I state in very old fashioned form, actually, I'll explain a little bit later why uh, this is old fashioned, is uh, really um, coming from the, uh, from, from the work of uh, um, Xavier Fernic in the 70s and then Michel Talagrand uh, really you know, building up on this in the 80s and 90s. And here's the idea. So, so let's suppose our process has what you would call sub-Gaussian increments. And this is exactly what I, what I was referring to when I said, well, there could be some, some measure of closeness uh, between the elements of the underlying index set, this metric D, and that could be reflected in the closeness of the corresponding uh, random variables making up this process. We assume that compared to D uh, between S and T, the increment XS minus XT is stochastically small. It's, uh, so the ratio is, is, is nice and sub-Gaussian. And if that's the case, then you have the following bounds. 
So here, this T naught is just for uh, the the. It, it's a nice trick. You if you if you consider um, if there's no absolute value here, you just subtract and affix T naught. Then the supremum of x t minus x t naught is always uh, always non-negative. Um, I mean, because th th this expected supremum is always non-negative, but then it, at least you're dealing with a bunch of non-negative random variables. So then you hope that really the most sophisticated inequality you need is Markov's inequality and a lot of ingenuity, which is basically the case. So it turns out that turns out that uh, the upper bound is like this. There's this functional which depends on a probability measure mu on your index space t. Think about it as a prior if you're a Bayesian or a weight. <laughs> your friends are offended. Uh, and t is an element of that space. And, and what you do is you integrate square roots of this log of one over uh, the probability of a ball of radius epsilon around t. Uh, the square root of log of one over x, really, I mean, if you look at the inverse of this function, you see why. Uh, but the point is that this quantity, if you now take the soup over t's and then inf over these priors or weights, you get an upper bound. Um, and, you know, and, and this integral is, I mean, how, how are you supposed to compute that, right? I mean, you, you're looking at measures of, 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 of balls in the metric space. It's hard to deal with, but it turns out to be tight. Uh, for example, if, if your process is Gaussian and the metric is actually just the canonical covariance matrix, metric, then you can actually reverse this. So this lower bound holds. This was proved by, by Telegrand in 1987. Um, and, you know, since then, of course, uh, um, there were, you know, lots of um, um, lots of improvements. So nobody wanted to deal with these things. Uh, by the way, the term majorizing measure comes from the, the definition that Fernie and Telegrand use this. If 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 probability measure mu on your on your metric space is such that this quantity is finite, or the supremum of this quantity is finite, they call the majorizing measure. It majorizes the process. But you know, so then nobody wanted to work with them, and 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 the results became sort of phrased in terms of various combinatorial things. Covering and packing trees, chaining over admissible sequences. Telegrand even had a paper called "Majorizing Measures Without Measures." Um, but uh, but but then you know if you look at this, if you're an information theorist and you see like if, you know, if you're a computer scientist, log n is like okay entropy, but log of one over probability. If you're an information theorist, like oh this is Shannon coding, <laughs> and uh, and Andreas Maurer is just one of my heroes because you know his his biography. If you if you read like his, his papers in the transactions and information theories, two lines, it says he's an independent scholar with an interest in information in, in, in probability and, and learning theory. Because I think he, uh, um, he patented some computer vision algorithms. And I think he also owned like either an olive, uh, you know, um, olive tree grove or a vineyard or something like that. Because, you know, he's a man of means who can like do all this stuff. So anyway, so, so he wrote, he wrote this, he, you know, he, he posted a preprint on his webpage that I was kind of obsessed with for a long time until I handed it to the right student who, who could make sense of it. Uh, he basically said, if you look at this, this is basically a number of bits. You know, I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? I mean, you, you, you give me a prior mu and, and this is how many bits you need to tell me to localize an element T to accuracy epsilon. And then, you know, and then, of course, with that, you say, oh, OK, but, uh, but if, if t is finite or discrete, which if t is compact, you can just approximate it by a discrete set, however large you want, then using this correspondence between codes and measures, the kraft macmillan inequality in information theory, we can, you know, spin all sorts of tales about how, in fact, the bounded, boundedness, boundedness of expected suprema, as Maurer said, is equivalent to the existence of efficient codes for the elements of t. It basically means that there exists at least one measure mu such that I assign it to the elements of T as a prior. And, uh, and actually, all the elements of T can be described using nice codes. And then there's also this multi-scale construction, right? Because what you're doing is you're actually averaging over, uh, over a whole bunch of different distortions up to the diameter of T. So uh, in this work, we kind of took this up. Maurer did not prove the lower bound. And his constructions are, uh, are somewhat hard to parse if you're an information theorist. So I wanted to phrase it in more familiar information theoretic language and see if, uh, if, if something interesting comes out of that. So, so we're gonna work with uh, basically this idea that, I just wanna see how, how well I'm doing. Oh, oh okay, okay, good. <laughs> 30 minutes and give a five minute Oh, cool. Um, right, so, so we're working, as I said, on a metric space. Sorry, but you only have 23 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fine. Oh, that's perfect. Um, so we have a we have a metric space, right? That's that's the that's the that's the set that indexes our random process elements. Think about it as maybe you know. I mean, these days everybody works with neural nets, 
So T is actually a you know, subset of a high dimensional Euclidean space listing all the weights of your neural nets or I don't know, your attention matrices or whatever it is that kids these days do. Um, but the point is it's a, it's, a, it's a compact metric space. It's a finite diameter, just set it to one. And we're going to look at variable length codes uh, that are lossy, right? So, so in other words, it's, we, have a, we, we basically have, um, we have a quantizer, pi. It, it maps elements of T to elements of T, but it has countable range. So, it's your, so, so the image of T under pi is your code book. Um, and then each element in the code book is associated to a binary string using a uniquely decodable code. And we know that uh, uniquely decodable codes have to satisfy Croft's inequality, right? So this is the usual thing. These are binary, binary lengths. And then we're going to say that this code, pi f, operates at resolution rho if, uh, if the error or distortion in reconstructing any element of t using a code is less than or equal to rho for old t. So these are codes where you have a guaranteed distortion, and the only thing you care about is, 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 is length. Notice that there's no probabilistic description here yet. There's no, there's no source model. This is just, these are just codes. The idea behind all these methods like generic chaining, majorizing measures, et cetera, which is something that Maurer pointed out is that what you really want is either a single code that gives you very, very long binary strings, but you can, it has this kind of a successive refinement property. You give me longer and longer strings, I can local, localize the elements of T better and better and better. Or you can actually give a sequence of codes and glue them together into a single code. Either way, we want to work with sequences of codes. So we're going to call a sequence of such codes admissible if the following three properties hold. So there's this kind of a, a markup structure. So if I know um, the representation of, of T uh, at K plus one level in the hierarchy, I don't need to know T. I can just construct, I can degrade it to, to the one below it deterministically. <laughs> Um, eventually, the codes will give me full reconstruction. So essentially, uh, as I keep going deeper, deeper into the sequence, I, I reconstruct each element perfectly. And finally, uh, well, I mean, this is kind of, the, you know, the descriptions have to get more and more informative. Right, and there are lots of ways of constructing this. Maurer, in, in fact, like this is what we instruct, extracted from Maurer's paper. He has a very, very clever construction where he doesn't need um, anything other than a probability measure on your, uh, on your set T. Assume T is countable. And from that probability measure, you extract various elements. You, you basically construct a sequence of codes in a very nice canonical way. But you can also go the other way. You can go bottom up. You choose uh, an increasing sequence of finite partitions of T. So it means that basically each element of the partition at level K plus one is a disjoint union of partition elements at the level below it. Um, choose a unique representative in each partition cell. Right, the usual quantization, right? Take, uh, take pi kt, the, 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 the you know, code uh, uh, element of t to the representative of the cell that it's in. And of course you have the nesting property. And uh, right, so, so the, the, you, know, you can also introduce a zeroth level as just a trivial zero rate code. And then all these things are, are nested. So that, that's precisely this whole successive kind of refinability thing. And then you can, you know, you can assign code lengths in whatever way you choose. For example, you can choose a probability measure corresponding to the partition elements. Just assign probabilities to partition cells in AK. And for each partition cell, have a conditional probability distribution given that you're not partition cell to refine to the next level, right? So you can just keep going. Um, so that's just one way. Like I said, Maurer's paper from 2010 has uh, a really, really clever construction um, that Yifang and I are going to describe in, in a journal version of, of this work. Um, yeah. A much simpler question. So you started with the raw market complexity, and to me, that's like a dispersion with the loss in the hypothesis class and all of that, you know, always in balance. So doing one number and you wanted an upper bound on that that's where you started and then you said there's log of something yeah the minds is of something else and therefore i'm going to take my space right but, but aren't you looking for an upper bound i'm, I'm sort of missing that connection how we will come back to it where's this coming coming in is this a way of representing the functional space itself yes it is that's precisely what it is right. you're not coding x's you're coding t's right okay so 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 this is an upper bound using codes so here we have a sub-Gaussian process. And then, you know, just, just take any admissible sequence of codes and then take a probability distribution P on, on integers, 
what you need, um, you can think about a sort of a, a um, I'll explain one way to interpret that. Uh, it's not exactly a, a, a prior, although you can think about it as sort of a um, mixing weights for a multi-scale representation. But the point is that these C and P are, are just free variables that you can, you can optimize over. And then with high probability, with high probability, the difference between XT and XT naught, again, this is just needed for, for the chaining argument to go through, um, is upper bounded by the following sum. So you, you sum over all your levels. And then rho K minus one, of course, is a distortion at level K minus one. And these are some, and you can think about this, this, uh, uh, this log is uh, natural log. Um, this is the code length plus another log of one over PK, um, which in the theorem it's needed for the union bound to go through, but operationally you'll see that there's a mixture uh, representation. The point is that this is this is a kind of a uh, it looks unwieldy, uh, but I'll explain um, where the key idea of the proof is. The main idea really comes from this paper of Mara. We just uh, uh, noticed a few things that you know he didn't and and, and streamlined a few things. Here's the idea. So we're going to assume that T is finite without loss of generality. T is compact and a process is separable. You can just approximate. And then because T is uh, finite, eventually you're going to hit the level in your hierarchy where pi K T is just going to re keep returning T. And that means that for each, for each element of your space T or your index at T, you can, you can write your X T minus X T naught. And the T naught is just some fixed point. Um, as this kind of a chaining decomposition. This is a starting point in all of the works using, you know, using these things. Like this is Dalagran's uh, idea, which he attributes to Kolmogorov in some sense. Right, and so of course, at each level, let's look at what happens to just the elements in the code book at level K, right? So, so remember that uh, S is in the code book level, level K, I can construct the corresponding element in the code book of level k minus one, the lower resolution right below it, without knowing s, without knowing t rather, right? So I can just, and so these things are are basically just bounded like that, right? Just because because uh, because of nestedness of all the sets, uh, with high probability. But of course, you know these hold individually with high probability. Then you have to string them together using union bound, and when you do that, you end up with this kind of a thing. And so then that's where you so so p k is needed. Um, basically, you, you know, you scale the probability for this event by PK, and then you use the fact that these, when you take the exp ex exponential of that and sum them up, you get one from Kraft Macmillan, et cetera, et cetera. The point is you get this bound, and that's the proof, but I want to actually uh, operationalize it a little bit. So, so as I said, what does that have to do with majorizing measures? Where, where is Telegram's work in, in all of this? Uh, and here's the idea. Take a sequence of codes, take this P, which is just this kind of instrumental just collection of weights. That P is not definitely, I wouldn't dignify it by calling it a prior. These are weights. Um, and then consider the following mixture. So what you do is, the, what you, do is you, you, you consider all the levels at once. Uh, you, assign, you assign weight PK to level K. And this is just, uh, and this simply is the probability measure corresponding to, to, to the code book at level K, just using, using the construct, construction and craft. Right, because the, the, the quantity in the craft sum is a sub probability measure. That's what, that's what unique decodability means. And I can just normalize it. And then you can actually, you know, then from this, you can basically just canonically ex extract a sequence of partitions such that if I were to look at the probability assigned to element T, um, when I look at it at this resolution of, at level K, the description length of that is basically the description length of this code plus that. And the reason why we need this is, is for this whole thing when I stitch it together to, to give me, uh, to give me uh, a bona fide uh, uniquely decodable code. And so you see that the operational interpretation is that for any such mu, the expected supremum of a process is, um, is, is bounded by the following quantities. You look at your elements of your underlying index set and for each set you, you sum up the resolution at scale K times the square root of the description length for T at level K, square root of log of one over the probability. Again, that comes from the sub-Gaussian assumption, right? You can put you know, other assumptions on the tails and based on that, you would have instead of you know, power one half, you would have power one over P with, for some P bigger than one, right? Okay, so, so this, is, this is interesting, but there's an even better um, result. 
that basically says, well, you know, why am I even bothering with, with these multi-scale constructions? The idea is that if I know what happens at scale k minus one, remember, can I success can I refine it to scale k? And it turns out that yes, actually you can. The point is that for convenience, let's suppose that uh, the errors of, of these uh, code decrease exponentially with k. So take like rho k to be like two to the minus k, which is a standard construction in, in Telegram's work. Um, just take, uh, you know, and then, and then give uh, uh, exponentially decaying weights to all the levels. And then you can just uh, manipulate stuff and use subadditivity of, of square root to end up with this kind of a bound. So the constant came, here comes from the fact that all you're doing is just summing a geometric series. Um, and it doesn't matter. The interesting thing is this. So this is the distortion. And this, you can see that this is, uh, this is the excess length that you have to provide in order to localize T to a better level of description given uh, the description at, at level K minus one. And so then, and then the idea is that actually for any, for any majorizing measure, for any prior on mu in any sequence of partitions, you can always construct a sequence of codes such that this quantity is actually upper bounded by something, by something more interesting. And this is exactly the difference in code lengths uh, in a Shannon code. And these quantities, of course, then, then, you, can, then you can convert this into, into uh, Riemann sums into integrals and you can actually get the bound um, that appeared in the majorizing measure theorem. Oh, nice. Twelve minutes. Yeah, 11 minutes. Really? Because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I think it'll be a lot of times for questions. Um, okay, so 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 this is nice, and we have, we in fact have a lot of examples where we where we can you know just give you different ways of constructing these. Uh, there 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 are, there are just uh, any strategy for co constructing these kind of sequential sequential multi-resolution codes will give you something something interesting, and we have some examples where we just recover a whole lot of existing bounds. Um, but the interesting thing is this lower bound, right? So because, uh, because it's, it's, it's the lower bound for, for Gaussian processes that, that was kind of, that was proved by Telegram um, in 1987 using majorizing measures. And like I said, you know, and then, yeah, he, found, he found partition based uh, techniques. So can we have a coding interpretation for that? And it turns out that we can, um, and it looks like this. So now this is a Gaussian process, zero mean, and my metric, but this is important, this metric has to be the covariance, covariance uh, metric, right? So, um, and if that's the case, then for any, so here R uh, has to be large enough, um, such that you, you build a sequence of codes at resolutions uh, R minus K. These, so, so previously the codes, you know, could be arbitrary. Here, uh, you construct a specific sequence of codes such that this lower bound holds. Notice that previously we had R to the minus K plus one. Here we have R to the minus K, but R eventually when you want to approximate this by integrals, you take R to be like five or whatever. This is just a constant because you know, all the other powers of R will get sucked into the integral and they will no longer, uh, no longer matter. Because the, the, the whole point is that here, uh, you want to show that these upper bounds and lower bounds hold up to multiplicative constants. But once again, you see this interesting thing that uh, this quantity having to do with codes is for Gaussian processes fundamental. And that has to do with the fact, I mean, so if you kind of squint and try to explain why uh, you would expect something like this. Well, um, Gaussians have this nice property that it doesn't matter whether, whether you're a Bayesian or a frequentist or whether you're doing, you know, complexity regularization because negative log likelihood of a Gaussian is a quadratic function. And, and then you also get this log determinant <laughs> so, so, so those things, uh, so you're doing least squares, but you can also pretend that you're doing some, you know, Bayesian regularized uh, optimization or, you know, re uh, or, or, or you're doing some sort of complexity penalty or whatever, right? So, so the point is that somehow there's this very natural relation between, uh, you know, Gaussians, their log probabilities, um, code lengths, and this, uh, this is also the basis of various things like AIC or, you know, Rissonen's early ideas or, or Andrew Marin's ideas. And then, and then also, because we're here, uh, we're working with Gaussian processes, uh, this would immediately translate into, um, into distances in, in our space, right? Because the covariances are taken to be the, the uh, inducing the metric. Okay, so, so I'm gonna, 
explain the proof um, in some detail, um, not too much, because I mean it, 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 it does get kind of hairy. But the point is that this is this was first proved by Telegram in 1987 using majorizing measures, and then you know later, later you know Telegram, I, you know he he basically is like, oh, I, you know what I did in like ten years ago is not good enough. I'm going to reprove it using another method. Um, so he proved it using partitions, no measures appearing. And and Vitol Bednor um, had another argument where he said, well, you can kind of have an argument that uses both partitions and measures because it brings back the original spirit of of all these results. So let me briefly explain how it's proved. Um, so, so let me denote by G of A, G for Gauss, obviously, uh, the supremum when I only look at elements of, of A, which is some subset of T. So we're going to do the following. We're, gonna, we're, going to, uh, we're going to construct a partition or a sequence of partitions in a particular way. These partitions, so Telegram, there was a greedy procedure. The idea is that um, you, you look at your current, you, you construct your current partition. You take an element in that partition, and then you basically cover it by balls of, of radius 2 to the minus k, so you're at level k. And then you basically start peeling off the ones that, you know, peeling off the ones that give you the largest value of g. And then, uh, and then so, so you peeled off a set intersected with a, Remove that, keep going. You're going to stop eventually because your, sp your space is compact and it has, a, a, it has bounded packing and covering numbers. So, so, so the idea is that, and then you repeat it for all the elements in the partition in such a way that there's, there's going to be a certain relation between these GAs in the set A at partition level K and its children in the next level. And this relationship comes from uh, a very fundamental result that only holds for Gaussians called Sudakov mineration. Um, and basically it just says that, you know, there's, there's a relationship between GA and then the uh, Gs of its descendants plus a correction that has a square root log cardinality. And, and the cardinality in there is basically the number of steps you, you use in this greedy procedure. Um, the point is that you end up with this partition and this partition uh, somehow keeps track of, of the growth of these GAs in a very, you know, very, very precise way. And then, you know, then I want to construct a code. So, so basically, the main thing is really constructing these code lengths because pi k is you have a partition at level k, just pick a point and each partition element, that's your code book. But now, of course, remember that there's, first of all, there's nestedness, right? If I have, if I have A, which is a set at level k, and I have its descendants at level k plus one, um, then, then you want to keep track of the number of descendants for each set. And when you do that, you say, okay, if I already could assign lengths at level K, I can assign lengths at level K plus one by simply telling you which of the descendants of AKT you're in. This IK pi KT is basically the number of, um, of the set containing pi KT that was assigned to it using this greedy construction. And of course, you know, the, the, you know here the idea is that uh, uh, the sum of uh, one over n squared as you sum over, as you sum over all the n's is finite, right? So, so that way, you, you, you know, you, you basically keep assigning these code lengths and you satisfy Kraft's inequality at each level. You end up with this sequence of codes and you see that this, uh, the, the main thing really is that the excess length here is actually proportional to log of the number of steps you took in this partition, which is precisely that error term in the Sudakov inequality, which I'm not going into. So this is this is the key inequality that you know that you can see in the work of Telegram and Bednors. We just connected it to codes. Like I said, here here what's happened what's happening is that you're level k, but you have to look at the level below and a level above. So you're going to have to skip a level. So so basically, for any point t, uh, this Gaussian supremum of the set containing t at level k minus one plus a slack, C is a constant. You can write it down explicitly, but six, I think. Um, and, and so then you skip a level, which is accounted for here. This is the excess length when, when you go from level K minus one to level K. And then again, because of the nestedness of all these sets and this Sudakov inequality that, that you use, you end up with this kind of a bound. And then you, know, this is, then you do exactly what Telegram and Bednors did you, you, can, you can basically just um, iterate. You use induction. So when k is equal to one, this is a zero t. A zero t is the entire set. So you have g of t, 
which is which is what you want at the lower bound. But it's lower bounded in terms of in terms of you know the 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 points and successive levels of, of refinement. So you need to kind of you know do this for a zero key and then a one key, then sum, and then after you sum, you you end up with with this quantity. So the point is that uh, I mean I think I think I think I was able to describe what's going on you know more or less you know accurately. The the main idea really is that. There is this there is this partitioning that that somehow respects you know the the growth properties of this of these galaxy and suprema and then all we really do is ke keep careful track of where in this partitioning you are and you can actually use that to construct the code that's basically the idea okay so I think I can summarize uh, and then I'll briefly tell you where you know I think this this should go or could go the main thing really is the following we have you know the main the main object of interest is a process. Right, think about it as a generalization error of a learning algorithm or Radomacher complexity or what have you. The process is zero mean, it has these sub Gaussian increments. Um, another piece of the picture is uh, a variable length code, which is a lossy code with a variable length representation. Right, so we assume that um, there's a distortion and the distortion between T and its image under the code is no more than row. So for a sequence of such codes, we associate this quantity that keeps track of the distortion incurred, right? So this is distortion in, in going from level k minus one to level k. And this is the excess length in going from level k minus one to level k. And then we showed that, well, this quantity actually uh, turns out to, if you don't want to talk about measures, you can talk about codes as, uh, as we know as information theorists. So, so the upper bound is, is this, right? Minimize over codes, well, sequences of codes, maximize over points, and for the for the Gaussian process, this bound could be reversed. And really, the you know the, the main idea, which I think is something that Maurer pointed out, and I, and I think this is very fruitful, is that well, you should actually think about learning algorithms as random measures on your on your uh, on your on your set T. And if that's the case, then then you can think about a learning algorithm. If you let's say you know discretize your hypothesis space, learning algorithm assigns weights. Or, or likelihoods or whatever you want to call it to, to the elements of the hypothesis space that gives you a code. So these codes can actually, um, you know, you can, you can use it in various frameworks, like maybe let's say there's this ter term called zero shot learning. And that's basically like you pre-trained on some data and then you, you, know, and you, you, and then you just take that and just minimally tweak it. And, and then you have performance on some, on some unrelated, uh, well, on some different, but, but possibly related set of data where you can think about the the uh, the distribution over your hypothesis space as coming from this um, uh, previous sort of some previous training and that distribution already encodes some some quote unquote prior or or code uh, or gives you description length for for each hypothesis okay so i'll stop here um, and take questions and well if you want to see the details it's on archive and Yifang is also going to give a virtual talk at um, ISIT this summer. Minutes to two for questions. Let's see if it's up. Oh, okay. Nice, good one. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, excellent talk. Thanks, Max. So, one question is about uh, we have a construction for this VLC post-relative soil. Uh, we're working on that. I, you know, and so this is precisely where I think Van Handel's uh, contraction method could possibly help, or maybe, or maybe that paper you sent me by uh, Joad, Joad Mutara. Okay, I don't know if you're collecting uh, applications, but I guess the the nice thing about this interpretation is the the work I was saying on Lipschitz optimization. Those can be codes in in some yeah. ways for for the yeah. setup. And yeah. And the nice thing is that for the Bayesian setting of the problem I stated, it gives you sort of a regret bound, which is random. Right. And it depends on yes. high probability of yes. what you're covering. Yeah. So so actually we, we posted a paper on archive recently where we said, well, instead of taking the soup, you can just take any so basically you have a random process and then you have and you select one of the keys randomly based on mm -hmm. some data. So now you look at the expectation of X capital T. Well, mm -hmm. X tau, I guess. Tau is a random variable. So can you actually, uh, can, because you know, soup is just a particular random variable which just extracts the maximizer. Oh yeah, that, that could actually. Uh, thanks. I think I have to give. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, there. Somebody said. Oh, okay. 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 Okay.
very naive one. Yes. Can I tie that to Dudley's inequality? Uh, well, Dudley's inequality is not tight. I mean, that's like basically, so our upper bounds will give you Dudley. So you, you imply that? Oh, yeah. I mean, but, but Dudley's bound is, like I said, it's just known to be not tight. It's just the, the, the reason why people use Dudley is because you don't need any, in, if you just have that integral and you have the, you know, bounds and covering numbers, all you need is like calculus to compute these things. But in many cases, it just, it's just, you know, just wildly off. But yeah, I mean, these, these all these bounds will, will give you Dudley. Because once you have majorizing measure from that, that from, from that is Dudley follows. The difference is that you can compute often. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Max. Um, uh,